Hello everyone, I'm back. Uh, I had, uh, well, I had to have something for dinner and while well, it was kind of late dinner, so there you go. Anyway, so let's look at the menagerie. And yes, I'm going to be reviewing parts one, parts one and two, so it's going to be a long one, so here we go. On Star Day 3012.4, the Federation Starship USS Enterprise arrives to Starbase 11 in response to a subspace call First Officer Spock reported receiving from the former captain of the Enterprise, Christopher Pike, under whom Spock had served. Captain Kirk and Spock meet the Starbase commander, Commodore Mendez, who doubts that Pike had sent the message. Given that Pike was in a severe burn accident and confined to wheelchair for the rest of his life and unable to communicate, save through answering yes-no questions, with the aid of a device in the wheelchair that is operated by his brainwaves. Pike refuses to communicate with anyone except Spock, and Kirk and Mendez leave to discuss the situation. Once they are gone, Spock informs Pike that he will be taking him regardless of Starfleet's orders. He overwhelms Pike's guards and takes him aboard the Enterprise, and through a series of deceptions, he convinces the crew to set a new course on Starfleet's orders. Meanwhile, Kirk and Mendez are concerned with Spock's behavior and find that there was no record of Spock receiving any message. Mendez provides Kirk with classified information on Talos IV, a planet that was visited by the Enterprise previously under Pike's command, and now they and now under strict, no-contact Starfleet regulation. The they are made aware of the departure of the Enterprise and the two through chase in the Starfleet shuttlecraft. When Spock detects him trailing the Enterprise, he has him brought aboard and then willingly gives himself up, confess confessing to committing mutiny. The crew finds they are unable to stop the current course of the Enterprise, which Spock affirms is heading toward Talos IV. Mendes demands a preliminary hearing be held, which requires three commanding officers. Kirk objects and Lahia and Mendez are present, but Spock knows that Pike is also, a com is also a command officer still listed for active duty. The tribunal begins, and Spock offers his testimony, uh, and Spock offers as his testimony video footage of the Enterprise's early visit to Talos IV. In the original mission, the Enterprise traveled to Talos IV in response to a stress call, stress call from the survey ship Columbia, reported lost 18 years previously. Pike, Spock, and an away team beam down to the planet and find a number of survivors, including a young Vina, a child born shortly after the crash of Columbia. Dr. Boyce, Pike's chief medical officer, finds the survivors in excellent medical health, a fact that he believes belies the living conditions of the survivors. Before Dr. Boyce can alert Pike, Pike is lured away by the rest of the team from the rest of the team by Vina into a cave which closes off. The remaining survivors in their camp suddenly disappear. Pike finds that he has been shot by the Telosians. Human aliens have been monitoring the away crew and able to mass project illusions such as those of the survivors. In the present, Kirk learns that the video source that Spock has been showing is not from data archives, but instead is being broadcast to them from Talos IV. Starfleet has learned of the attendant destination of the Enterprise, and Mendes orders Kirk to stand down as the captain is responsible for all members of his crew. Kirk demands Spock in the transmission, but Spock reluctantly refuses, and the episode ends as Spock is sent to be locked up as the Charbino ends at recess. Now, on to part two. The Charbino Spock continues despite Starfleet's orders to end the Talos IV transmissions. The footage continues from before, where Pike has been caged with Vina. The Telosians want the two to mate to produce offspring and allow the Telosians to rebuild their civilization, which fell after they discovered the ability to cast these illusions. The aliens put the two through numerous virtual realities, hoping to give Pike mild interest in Vina to copulate. Pike refuses, and does not relent when the Telosians project more horrific images to him. Meanwhile, the Enterprise crew find the cave where Pike disappeared, but they aren't able to break it open even when using direct attacks from the ship itself. They attempt to beam in a landing party into the cave, but this is detected by the Telosians, and they manipulate the beam to only allow the female crew members to beam down, and to offer more choices to Pike. While the new captives have phasers, they attempt to shoot a portion of the cage wall but find them ineffective. That night, Pike is able to capture Telosian as the being tries to confiscate the phasers. Pike ins intuits that the phasers do still work, and that the early attempt at escape was masked by an illusion, and forces the Telosians to reveal the hole they had previously made. The group escapes to the surface, but learned that this was allowed by the Telosians, in hopes the humans would become a slave colony on the planet's surface. Number one attempts to set her phaser on overload, but preferring rather to preferring to die rather than be enslaved. She is persuaded, but she is persuaded to deactivate the weapon when more Telosians arrived after having scanned the Enterprise databanks. The aliens have learned that humans have a hatred of captivity 
and agreed to let the crew go. Pike is upset that the Telosian do not even apologize for holding them. The head Telosian, the Keeper, explains that they are now resigned to the end of their civilization. Pike offers help from the Federation, but the Telosians refuse, fearing that the Federation will learn of the illusion powers and fall like their own civilization. Agreeing to leave the Telosians to peace, all but Pike are being back to the ship. Pike has shown the Venus Lukes have been illusion all along. After su having suffered great injury on the crash of the Columbia, but has been restored to health and is at peace with the help of the Telosian's illusions. Pike returns to the ship, assured that Vina will be well looked after. The transmission ends as at the tribunal just as the ship is, is arriving at Talos IV. Kirk knows, Kirk, now knows this, Kirk now knows what Spock's plans have been, as the Telosians will be able to offer Pike the same treatment as Vina. The court martial was revealed as a diversionary tactic by the Telosians when the figure of Commodore Mendes suddenly fades away Having been an illusion on, having been an illusion both on the Enterprise and in the shuttlecraft, as Kirk is advised by the Keeper who appears on the viewing screen, telling Kirk that Spock had related to them Kirk's strength of will, and that the fiction of the court martial was to delay Kirk from too soon regaining control of the Enterprise before it reached Talos IV. A message from Commodore Mendes then advises that Starfleet also was when also was witnessing the same imagery itself, and officially waves the prohibition against the planet for this one occasion in recognition of Captain Pike's service. Spock is cleared of old charges, though he tells Kirk he did not explain his actions to prevent Kirk from becoming ex an accessory to the crime. Pike is transported to the planet where he is met by Vina and the Telosians. While broadcasting to the Enterprise, they cast the illusion on Pike, and he and Vina are shown returning to with the Telosians into their cave. Kirk observes this on the viewing screen, and the Keeper appears one last time, wishing Kirk well. The Enterprise leaves orbit to return to Starfleet. Ooh, man, there was a lot going on in that story, huh? Anyway, let's look at the, let's look at the production elements, shall we? The Menagerie solved two problems. By reusing the extensive footage from the cage and was a, and was a script crunch. The script was written by Gene Roddenberry, creator of the show, also the writer of The Cage. The script for both parts of this episode is only 64 pages long, shorter than the scripts from for some single episodes. Part 1 is 43 pages long, whereas Part 2 runs to only 21 pages. Oh, me. New filming took place for the framing story for The Cage. Because actor Jeffrey Hunter was unavailable to reprise his role as Captain Pike, Oga-like actor Sean Kenny played the injured captain in new scenes, while the hunter was represented in the Cage flashback footage and credited accordingly, along with the other original Cage cast. Also in the new scenes, Malachi Throne, who, pro who provided the voice of the Keeper in the original Cage, portrayed Commodore Jose Mendez, while Julie Parrish played personal assistant Miss Piper. Because Throne played a second role in the menagerie, the Keeper's voice was electronically processed to sound higher pitched. This modified voice would replace Malachi Throne's original voice work in the remastered and new original versions of the cage released later, and allowed the Keeper to then address Captain Kirk by name at the conclusion, a part to advising Kirk he was hearing the Keeper's thought transmissions and that the invalid fleet Captain Pike was welcome to live with them unfettered by his physical body, further addressing Kirk by name as illusion fully able body Pike is seen walking with Vina, the keeper wishing Kirk as pleasant a future. The preview trailer for part two uses Thrones original keeper's voice. The framing story was directed by veteran truck director Mark Daniels. Because most of his footage was used in part one, he was given directing credit for this part. The director of the cage, Robert Butler, was given credit for part two because most of that footage was from the original pilot. In the scene on Rigel 7, Vina is Vina actually plays slave girl painted in green makeup and dancing for Captain Pike. During pre production makeup tests, using Mitchell Baird as a stand in, they sent the footage out for printing and when the film returned, there was a little difference. The lab thought there had been an error in color racing and thought they should compensate. The first time this happened, they were shot the film with a darker green and sent out again for printing. The same thing happened again, but eventually the lab was notified to make no color changes. Footage from the master negative of the cage was edited into the master negative of the menagerie. No other color or 35mm copy of the cage existed, only a black and white 16mm print owned by Gene Roddenberry. In 1987, the full color negative trims from the cage that had not been used in the menagerie were discovered at a film laboratory in Los Angeles and returned to Paramount Pictures. Whew, man, so that was a lot to go through for just a two-parter, huh? But still, a very enjoyable two-parter nonetheless. I give the menagerie five warp cores out of five. Well, join me next time as we explore the conscience of the king. Until then, 
Live long and prosper, everybody.